Hi, I'm George Saltzman. If you're like me, you spend a lot of your time trying to motivate educators to become better teachers. I want to help them make changes in their classroom. I want to encourage them to try new teaching styles and new technologies. Finding something for my teachers to try, that's the easy part. The hard part is actually motivating them to do it in their classroom, on their own. Why is it so hard to get adult professionals to try new things? Motivation is a topic that's been researched and written about by a number of educational researchers. As a professional developer, I need all the help I can get, and I expect you to too. We're going to walk through what the research says we need to do to be successful in professional development and building a culture of innovation. As it turns out, what the research says that works best with motivating adults isn't exactly what you might think it says. It's actually a lot different than what I was told back in college, and it's a lot different than the way we're currently doing things, and it's really interesting. In many professional development contexts, we motivate professional educators by saying, you have to. We require in-service teacher training sessions. We require some number of professional development hours per year. The motivation we provide isn't intrinsic, where people want to do something because they find it interesting or enjoyable. Often, it's extrinsic. You do it because we want you to do it. And in the process, we'll provide some reward, like a stipend, or we'll remove a punishment, like being fired. Most of what we think about motivation comes from the behaviorist approach, formulated by such famous behaviorists as Ivan Pavlov and B.F. Skinner. This is the motivation scheme we all know. If you do something we want you to do, you get a reward. If you do something we don't want you to do, you get a punishment. A group of researchers studied providing rewards for children for performance on their standardized test. They tried this on 7,000 students in the Chicago Public Schools. What they found is when they were offered $20 incentives, student scores went up 0.2 standard deviation points above what they would have otherwise predicted based on their previous test scores. In academic terms, we call this incentive theory. It's used to attract people to the behavior that we want. The flip side of incentive theory is drive theory. Drive theory uses negative reinforcement like the value-added performance mandates that fire teachers if student test scores are too low. Perhaps the most famous proponent against incentive theory is Daniel Pink. According to Pink in his book Drive, the carrot-stick approach works well for manual tasks. You make more widgets, you get more money, and it works that way. But when tasks involve even rudimentary cognitive skill, higher rewards lead to less performance. Pink used examples of open source software such as Linux and open data projects such as Wikipedia as examples of projects where people have spent thousands upon thousands of hours for no reward beyond having accomplished something meaningful. In Drive, Daniel Pink builds on the research of Richard Ryan and Edward D.C. Pink calls it an absolute treasure trove of research on human motivation. D.C. and Ryan refer to drivers as autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Pink describes these motivators for higher-order tasks as autonomy, mastery, and purpose. The RSA Animate video provides a great summary of drive and the overall concepts of Ryan and DC. Pink describes the extrinsic motivators that don't work as the seven deadly flaws. Extrinsic motivators extinguish intrinsic motivation. They diminish performance, they crush creativity, and they crowd out the good behavior. They encourage cheating and shortcuts and unethical behavior to get to the reward faster. They become addictive and they require people uh, to seek more and more of them. They foster short-term thinking as the rewards become the only focus. Now, if you were reading Drive, you would think the work of DC and Ryan was all about workplace performance, but it's actually on personal development, and it has a lot of importance for those of us who are trying to get adult learners to become self-directed learners. Ryan and uh, DC developed the self-determination theory. Self-determination is a macro theory of human motivation. It focuses on the degree of which individual's behavior is self-motivated and self-determined. 
Since 1985, there's been a lot of work on the idea of self-determination theory. Risi and Ryan propose that humans have inherent growth tendencies. We covered these growth tendencies before as autonomy, competence, and relatedness. These are built-in human psychological needs that form the basis for self-motivation and personal integration. This is exactly where self-determination theory leaves the cause and effect ideas of behaviorism behind. Changing behavior isn't about pushing or pulling, rewarding or punishing, but it's about building on these intrinsic motivations that are already inside each of us, and it requires that each person make that change personally, on their own volition. Other researchers documented these three essential elements of the theory. They are that humans are inherently proactive with their potential and mastering their inner forces, such as their drives and emotions. Humans have inherent tendencies towards growth and development and integrated functioning. Optimal development and actions are inherent in humans, but they don't happen automatically. What self-determination theory has found is really rather amazing. Unlike the study of high school students who are paid for improving test performance, tangible rewards negatively impact the motivation and interest of adult learners. But while rewards didn't work with adults, positive praise did. Praise is an easy thing to do and it requires absolutely no additional resources to accomplish. Another study specifically demonstrated that in educational settings, where learning is involved, positive feedback was a highly motivating factor in an adult's ability to learn and do new things. Want to create a culture of innovation in your school? It's not about the external rewards that you provide, but the intrinsic rewards and positive feedback. Yes, you need to pay teachers if you want them to show up on work on Monday morning, but aligning performance incentives too closely to the core job functions can stifle innovation. So if educators are so intrinsically motivated, then why are they so resistant to professional development events? It's the over-justification effect. Being forced to do something simply makes it unenjoyable. The intrinsic reward of getting my box checked for showing up overrides any of the intrinsic motivation attendees might have had prior to going in. The research found that if teachers, for example, were required to do one task, such as a required professional development activity, prior to being allowed to engage in a second intrinsically enjoyable task, like exploring iPod uses in the classroom, then the first task of professional development is going to be uninteresting because the second activity is so much more preferable. You're standing in their way, and that's a negative response. Providing access to self-help or just-in-time resources will be much more enjoyable than required events, even if the content is delivered in the same compelling ways. Since we can't force educators in the training, what we're going to need to do is motivate them instead. And there are several cognitive theories that play into self-determination theory that directly address how to provide motivation. The first is goal-setting theory. Goal-setting theory says that individuals have a drive to reach a clearly defined end state. We want to complete the task. Um, reaching that goal provides an intrinsic reward. It feels good to accomplish something. When setting goals, the goal theory says there are three things that affect our motivation. Proximity, how long it takes us to get there. Difficulty, how hard it is to get there. And specificity. How clear is the path to get there? An idea goal would have an end state close to the initiation of desired behavior. The closer the goals end to the behavior that we're seeking, the better. Make the goal changing the behavior, not about the resulting outcomes from changing the behavior. Once the behavior changes, then you can work towards secondary goals, but make sure the behavior changes first. Remember, the goal is about changing the behavior. 
Using SMART goals are an idea way to leverage goal setting theory and outcomes. SMART goals are specific, is the goal clear and unambiguous? What is it that we want to accomplish? Measurable, there are concrete criteria for measuring if you reach the goal. How do we know when it's accomplished? Attainable, is the goal realistic? Can the goal be accomplished? Relevant, choosing a goal that matters and is that goal worthwhile? And then finally, timely, how long will it take us to get there? There are a number of great books on SMART goals that are helpful in creating your culture of excellence. Doug Smith's Make Success Measurable, Switch How to Change Things When Change is Hard, and there are also a number of books that are focused on education, such as More Than a SMART Goal, Staying Focused on Student Learning. The second cognitive theory that plays into self-determination is a model of behavior called volition. Volition is the will of a person to accomplish the goals, the person's willpower, if you will. The volition or willpower of a person is ingrained in personality. Research in this area is a bit shallow, but we do know that by working in groups and being socially accountable, we can increase willpower. Alan Duchman observed that in patients with heart disease, even death was not threatening enough to increase the willpower to change behavior in 90% of patients. But adding a weekly support group did. Changing school culture requires social accountability to the goals. The more regular the accountability groups meet, the better. So now that you know how people become motivated, let's look at what you, as a leader, can do to help move your educators along to realizing the goals of professional development sessions. John Cotter, a professor at the Harvard Business School, devised an eight-step process for leading change. It connects almost perfectly with the self-determination theory elements that we've just covered. In leading change, Cotter examines 30 years of research and concludes that 70% of all major change efforts in organizations fail. Why? Because changing behavior has a lot less to do with the traditional professional development model of giving them analysis that changes their thinking, that changes their behavior, than it has to do with showing something that's a truth that hits their feelings, which in turn changes their behavior. As professional developers, we have to awaken the intrinsic motivators that drive our educators. Here's the steps that Cotter establishes to do that. Step one, establishing a sense of urgency. What will happen if we don't innovate? Create a guiding coalition. Who will be our innovators? Develop a change vision. What will it look like? Communicate the vision for buy-in. Make sure that as many as possible understand and accept the vision, empowering broad-based action, remove obstacles and change, encourage risk-taking and non-traditional ideas and activities and actions, generate short-term wins, celebrate the small steps, never letting up. This is a big one in education. We move from change initiative to change initiative to change initiative. Stick with one until it's done. Finally, step eight. Incorporate the changes into the culture. Michael Fullan says this takes at least three years to accomplish in schools. Be prepared to stick with it. If it's not worth three years of your time, it may not worth be doing institutional-wide as the professional development emphasis. So there it is, the research on self-determination theory that helps in understanding how to obtain the motivation you need to create a culture of innovation in your school goes opposite of what we've done in the past, but it really matters if you want to be successful. I hope this has been helpful. I'm George Saltzman. Thanks for listening, and keep on working to change the world.